Okay, hello. I'm going to kick off. I think we're just about ready. Um, so hello and welcome to this event on scaling up and de-risking the sustainable transition in agriculture, brought to you by the EU Young Farms Association, SEJA, as well as Food Drink Europe and One Planet Business for Biodiversity. My name is Natasha Foote. I am an agri-food reporter based here in Brussels with the EU media Euractiv, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's event. So there is this growing awareness of the need for a holistic approach to agriculture, one that benefits farmers, uh, climate and nature, a kind of win-win situation, um, while also addressing the current threats to soil, farmers' livelihood and food security. And there's already plenty of work ongoing there by our farmers towards this goal. But the question is, how can farmers be fairly rewarded for their contributions to the environment and to society and supported in this transition to sustainable farming? So that's what we're going to be discussing today. And we have a wealth of expert speakers with us uh, to do so, from farmers uh, to industry representatives and policymakers, so really the whole gang here, to bring their perspectives to the table and explore how they each play their part uh, in scaling up this sustainable transition. But before we get stuck into our panel <coughs> sessions today, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Liberal MEP and Chair of the European Parliament's MV Committee, Pascal Tanfin, for his welcoming words. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you to my colleague, Lara, uh, for uh, co-hosting this uh, event. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to the European Parliament. Uh, as we know, this issue is one of the most uh, sensitive and, and also one of the most important we have to deal with uh, in the context of the Green Deal. So. I guess you know uh, very well what the Green Deal is. It's uh, a set of 75 legislative proposals, so 75 European laws, uh, where put together, we try to get a couple of key objectives, first one being being climate neutral in 2050 uh, and restoring nature uh, over the same uh, period of time. Uh, and, of course, other elements like uh, fighting against pollution and so on and so on. But uh, this is, for the first time, a comprehensive and, you said, holistic agenda. Uh, the problem when it comes to uh, the uh, agricultural transition is that uh, we do not think it so far as a comprehensive package. Uh, one key uh, difference between all what we have on the table and uh, the climate package called the Fit for 55 is precisely that the Fit for 55 was a package of 14 legislative proposals and you can see very easily the consistency, the reasoning, the trade-offs, the compromise and so on. And that's why we went up to the Fit for 55 for all the, the text altogether. What we have uh, on our desk, as an MEP and uh, four member states the same, uh, is a number of texts uh, directly related to the agri-transition, the scaling up, and so on and so on, but in, in a silo way. Okay, so we have, uh, I'm not going to list all of them, but uh, carbon farming, and I will get back to that, uh, we have um, a soil directive, we have a nature restoration law, we have the pesticides, we have the new genomic techniques. As a whole, it could design a pathway for scaling up, de-risking, putting things together. But the problem is that it is separated. So one of my role here is precisely to try to get this holistic approach, putting all the pieces together not only to have consistency at the end, but also to have an integrated narrative. Because for farmers, if there is no logic behind, why they will follow. Second, uh, we need to think more in terms of uh, value chain. Uh, so far, when we, as legislators or the Commission, as a uh, uh, having the, the monopoly of the uh, uh, legislative proposal. Uh, when uh, you design policy tools for uh, agri-transition, it mainly, sometimes exclusively, focus on 
farmers, on the producers. We all know that at the end of the day, it's the value, ch value chain that matters, because if it's not reflected in the commercial contracts, it's, if it's not reflecting in the whole value chain and the business relationships, at the end of the day, it cannot work. And the business relationships means uh, buyers, uh, means uh, sellers, means the value chain. And my personal uh, uh, feeling, and, and I know that the Commission is working hard on it now, and with uh, DG Clima, is to design <laughs> is to design uh, for him uh, or her, I don't know, uh, for the next term, to start with the next term, uh, what I think is a big missing tool. The missing tool is what I call ETS for food. On industry, we have the ETS, and it works and we have now uh, a price which is around uh, 90 euros per ton. On the agri transition, we have the CAP. I can tell you, the CAP will never be radically changed. Because there is, it's a legacy policy. Okay? It, it has been sold so many times to so many stakeholders in one way that you cannot just say, okay, delete, now I redesign completely the CAP. It will not work. So, of course, we need to adjust, modernize, and so on, the CAP, but very doubtful that we will uh, change it radically. So we need to invent something in between ETS for industry and CAP targeting only farmers. And what we need is, to my view, an equivalent of ETS, but for the food sector. Starting with the end of the farm, so the, uh, uh, the big cooperatives, and uh, uh, com big companies buying things, uh, milk, whatever, uh, from farms, up to the retails and all the uh, uh, companies behind, uh, between, sorry, between. And that could drive change, because then it, the core of this tool would be the value chain approach, which is exactly, to my view, what is missing today. That's for the discussion, and that's uh, also, of course, for uh, the work uh, for the next term on this commission. Just to conclude, uh, what is very important in, on that approach, and that's why I'm very much, I'm very happy to co-host this, uh, this event, is that precisely we need to talk together uh, between farming organizations, farmers' organization, business on all the value chain, and lawmakers. And if we manage to find a deal on, okay, that could work, then it's uh, a game changer. Because otherwise, it will be always split, it will be always very complicated and unstable. And the last thing you, the companies need, the investors need, is instability because you cannot project yourself, you cannot invest. You cannot make your uh, business plan, and so on and so on. So we need to provide stability, and that's exactly why we need that kind of dialogue and discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that uh, very comprehensive overview. A very nice, timely reminder also of uh, thinking to the future. And you're never too young to learn about agriculture and agricultural policy, clearly. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And I'll now like to pass uh, the floor to our other co-host today, that's Socialist MEP, Clara Aguilera. Um, just to say that Clara will do her intervention in Spanish. So if you do need translation, there is translation available. You can, that's right, I can see everyone putting them on. Everyone knows the drill. But yes, you can get translation here. So I'll pass the floor to you, Clara. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Me expreso mejor en español. Mi inglés es muy limitado y no, no quería limitar este debate. Encantada de, y muchas gracias a la organización CEJA y a Fruity Europe por organizar este debate. Tengo que decir, estoy encantada en un debate de agricultura por una organización como la CEJA y ver tanta gente joven. Me encanta. Habitualmente son gente ya más mayor. Así que me encanta mucha gente joven y muchas mujeres, tengo que decirlo también. Que a veces no es muy habitual, cada vez más, pero no es muy habitual. Así que enhorabuena a la organización y felicidades por, por tener esta oportunidad de dirigirme y por supuesto encantada de compartir con Pascal Canfán 
esta apertura de debate muy interesante que podré estar un ratito con ustedes, aunque no todo lo que me gustaría tengo comisión esta tarde. Así que, bueno, decirles que en la Comisión de Agricultura esta semana hemos aprobado un informe muy importante del relevo generacional, que es una cuestión importante eh, para el, los sectores agrícolas y ganaderos. Tenemos un grave problema de falta de incorporación de un relevo generacional adecuado y de una falta de incorporación de jóvenes en, en, los, en estos sectores. Y, por lo tanto, esperamos que este informe que ha llevado mi colega Isabel Carballay, que sé que ustedes lo conocen, lo hemos aprobado esta semana e irá a pleno próximamente, pues sin duda tiene muchas medidas y muchas iniciativas. Pero hay una clave. Tienen que ser no solo las ayudas para incorporar hay problemas con la adquisición de suelo, evidentemente, y, hay, y a veces, tengo que decirlo porque lo conozco bien, a veces las ayudas del primer pilar de la política agrícola común no ayudan mucho, tampoco. Lo digo porque están muy ligadas a la tierra y, y eso hace que el perceptor de esas ayudas del primer pilar de la PAC bueno, se jubile y siga recibiendo ayudas, algo realmente que no facilita la incorporación de jóvenes. Por lo tanto, sí que es verdad que esa es una de las políticas dentro de la política agrícola que debería ayudar más, no únicamente, porque el problema no es solo eso, sino tiene que ser una actividad atractiva, fácil y que sea accesible. Por lo tanto, tiene más que ver con una acción horizontal que por una acción puntual, sectorial, el que se incorpore en jóvenes. Espero que que este nuevo informe sirva. En cualquier caso, eh, para referirme a la transición y del punto de vista de los sectores agrícolas, toda esta transición eh, ecológica en la que estamos con el Pacto Verde Europeo, eh, desde la Comisión tenemos, evidentemente, hemos asumido todos unos compromisos de neutralidad climática para el año 50 y tenemos la Agenda 2030 que nos obliga a estos sectores, evidentemente, como a otros, también a hacer cambios. Eh, cambios muy, enfo muy enfocados y muy diseñados desde la estrategia, como ustedes saben, de la granja a la mesa, y ya con los paquetes legislativos que se iban a desarrollar, muy a final de legislatura, tengo que decir, por lo que tanto la mayoría de los que tenemos ahora mismo comenzando el debate que son prácticamente muchos compartidos con la Comisión ENVID, que preside el señor Canfán, y con la Comisión de Agricultura y otras, va a ser, estamos muy pocos se van a poder ver aprobados definitivamente. Esa es la realidad. Han venido bastante tarde y es muy difícil, muy difícil. Si sí está esta estrategia muy enfocada en, un, en las medidas primeras en cuanto a la producción, bueno, a la mayor producción ecológica, a ese porcentaje del 25%, que para algunos países no es un problema, pero para otros están en porcentaje muy bajo, pero sobre todo lo que preocupa a los agricultores, y no con falta de razón, en mi opinión, es todo lo que significa la disminución de uso de fertilizantes y de fitosanitarios o pesticidas químicos para 2030, con esa reducción eh, del 50%. Este dossier, que ahora estamos justo nosotros, la parte de Agri la vamos a aprobar ya en la comisión del de 9 de octubre, de este dossier de reglamento de disminución de uso de fitosanitarios químicos. Y, bueno, pues finalmente, no sé si dará tiempo a culminarlo en la legislatura, pero bueno, nuestra parte ya la ten, sí que la tenemos bastante finalizada en cuanto a la Comisión de Agricultura. Esto preocupa mucho porque todos estos enfoques que está bien y que es una demanda social, es decir, yo no, es decir, digo claramente que cada vez más la sociedad pues quiere eliminar, quiere un mayor cuidado. Somos más sensibles en los temas medioambientales y evidentemente de salud pública y todo está relacionado, la sanidad vegetal, la sanidad animal con la propia salud pública, una sola salud, ese concepto tiene mucho que ver en ello. Por lo tanto, es importante. El problema, y que yo quiero destacar aquí, es que eh, los agricultores, en líneas generales, no tienen ningún problema en, 
el no tener, no usar más pesticidas químicos si hay alternativas agronómicamente fiables para poderlas usar. Y ese es el problema que, que tenemos realmente. Es decir, yo creo que hay que ir a esa reducción sin duda. El problema son los tiempos eh, y la transición y cuál es y habilitar de instrumentos que la ciencia y la innovación nos permita que esas plagas y que esa sanidad vegetal, que es muy importante, como la sanidad animal, poderla acometer y tener alimentos saludables, pues haya sustancias activas disponibles para acometer ese problema. Y el problema, lo que a mí me traslada, y yo lo conozco los agricultores, es que no hay... De hecho, ya hay muchos productos, porque esto no es nuevo. Saben ustedes que se está haciendo reducción de sustancias activas más peligrosas desde el reglamento 1107 con los disruptores endocrinos. Esto está haciendo que llevemos ya 12 años prohibiendo sustancias activas, pero el problema es que no hay alternativas. Y claro, el agricultor eh, y las organizaciones y bueno, los centros al final eh, dicen, bueno, si tenemos alternativas no es problema, no es una cuestión de querer usar necesariamente un pesticida o un herbicida, sino de una alternativa que te ofrezca acometer una plaga. Esa, esa es la cuestión. Y sistemáticamente, y acabo de tener esta mañana un, en, unas jornadas con el sector citrícola español, que hay dos plagas procedentes de Sudáfrica que están ya llegándonos a las puertas de Europa y no tenemos alternativas eficaces químicas, químicas ni de ningún tipo, por lo tanto ni siquiera eh, todavía tenemos un, claramente una afectación de ese problema. Y esa es la realidad que sucede porque, por lo tanto, nos parece muy bien la, las propuestas, la única cuestión que tenemos en el debate es ver en qué momento y en qué tiempos. Otro dossier, y voy rápidamente, porque tenemos poco tiempo, es el dossier que nos acaba de llegar. Yo creo que es imposible que se acometa en la legislatura los dossieres que nos han acabado de llegar. Eh, el dossier de NGT, de la nueva edición genómica, por ejemplo, yo considero, en mi opinión, que es una oportunidad de tener alternativa para poder sustituir quizás a algunos pesticidas químicos. Por eso necesitamos una regulación nueva de esa nueva edición genómica, que es verdad que es controvertida y que hay que, algunos que dicen que eso es OGM, yo creo que no, no hay modificación genética. Para mí necesita una regulación específica y me parece buena la propuesta de la comisión, pero tengo mis dudas de que pueda ser aprobado en la legislatura, una cuestión de tiempo. Sucede con otros dosieres muy importantes, también de semillas y otros, que no me detendré en ellos, pero que se nos va a quedar el, todo el paquete relacionado con la producción y la actividad relacionada con el Pacto Verde, se nos va a quedar bastante pendiente en la legislatura, porque el último pleno lo tenemos en el mes de abril y es muy difícil poder concluir en siete o ocho meses esto, algunos de estos dosieres. Nada hay más y felicidades de nuevo por este evento y, y ahora estaré encantada de escucharles en las siguientes intervenciones. Excellent. Thank you very much both to Clara and to Pascal for opening this event today. I'd like to invite you to take a seat. Uh, oh, and the, okay. Yes, you're free. You're free Thank to go. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I would now like to open the first panel session of today's event on the challenges to scale up sustainable and profitable farming models. And to do so, who better to hear from than a farmer themselves? And I feel like all too often in Brussels, maybe we have these conversations. They're not maybe anchored in the farm's experience. I'm very happy to welcome to the floor Elizabeth Heden, who is Vice President at the EU Young Farmers Association SEJA and a young farmer in Sweden. She's going to set the scene a little bit for us and talk us through her transition pathway as a young farmer. So Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Hello, welcome. Where, wherever you'd like, would you like to take the middle seat? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. 
and extra thanks to MIP, MIP uh, Kavfan and MIP Aguilera to as co-hosts for this event. My name is Lisbeth Dén and I'm a 28-year-old dairy farmer from Sweden. I'm also the vice president in CISA. Today I will tell you about the story from my field. And um, my husband and I started our lives as farmers on 1st January this year. We have owned the farm longer for four years, and before that, my mother-in-law and father-in-law had a farm. We have uh, 220 cows, which means that we have 460 animals in total, if you count the heifers and the calves. And we produce 2 million litre milk every year that we sell. So we have been doing some uh, investment the last year. Uh, as I said, we have only been doing this for nine months, but um, here you can see a picture from the barn where we had the cows. Next. <laughs> and uh, this is um, an example of that we are working with new technology. So one is an application for um, monitor the animal health for the calves. And the other one is the soiling map. Um, so we, we are putting money to do this to be more, uh, to save resources. Yes, next. Okay. Um, and we have also built a new larger roof on the biogas plant so we can store more gas. And this is because we have a local dairy at the farm, which means they, that they can use less fossil fuels in their production uh, because now we can store the gas for, for a longer time. Next. <laughs> and uh, here on the picture you see the first picture is uh, a Google map from our farm. And before we had a slurry lagoon at the farm center. And now we have built a slurry pit closer to the fields instead. Uh, which um, this we can reduce the transport of the manure. And the new pit also have a roof. So no nit nitrogen or and greenhouse gases will leak out. Uh, and we have also invested in a pumping line. And it's an electric pump. So um, we don't have to drive the manure from the farm to the fields. So we are reducing the driving. And we are also reducing noise from driving uh, on the farm center where we live at. So it's good for, the, for our environment and it's good for the planet as well. And for the neighbors, of course. And next. And now we are also, you see we're doing a lot of investment. <laughs> now we're also building a stable for the calves and the heifers. Um, and this one uh, will uh, improve the animal welfare. Before we had uh, younger animals at another farm, so we will also reduce the transports and the driving. Uh, and in this one, we can have the same feeding system as we have in the barn for the, cow uh, for the cows, which means that they can have food four times a day and they could have an individual adapt feed state, so they can grow in a more controlled way, uh, also for saving resources. And uh, this is a picture of what it looks like right now, because during the summer month, we have the animals out on pasture. Uh, they're among natural pastures, and uh, therefore we can keep the landscapes open and preserve the cultural environment we inherited from previous generation. And uh, the last 10 months, we have uh, employed three people, had five interns, we had a girl working during her summer holiday from school this summer. So we are living in a quite small town and we are giving a lot of job opportunities, which also have a sustainable impact. And um, the investments I have mentioned above have been very costly and especially a challenge for us that are new startup farmers. But we also see that as necessary. Uh, some of it is because it's uh, legal requirements, for example, the roof on the slurry pit. And some have been voluntary but necessary if we would like to be able to continue and develop our production. What has made this possible in several cases have been investment support from the EU and also something we call the climate step in Sweden. So um, the most of those investments have in one or another way been supported. Uh, and the big win for us is, of course, the saving resources, both when it comes to time, nature, resources and money. Uh, the big sh challenge is that the uh, financial incentives are sometimes too weak and uh, we don't know what the decision maker 
want the next year or the next four years, because our investments are more long term than one election period. Uh, and um, unfortunately, a few of those investments would give us more money for the milk. So it's just a cost for us as entrepreneurs. And uh, we already know more things that we would like to do to save time, money and the planet resource. But uh, we are lack of opportunity to do this because we don't have the capital. Uh, and I think that agriculture must become more prof profitable to become more sustainable and to cope with climate change better, but also to reduce our emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that, Elizabeth. So, yes. <laughs> Yes, you've been very busy. I don't know when yeah. you fit time into sleep and all of that. But um, yeah, I'm very curious to dig in more about your story in the panel session. And we will have the opportunity to do so because Elizabeth is going to stay for our panel. Um, and I'd like to also welcome to the floor to open up the panel um, our other speakers today. So we have with us today Catherine Gislin Lanel, who is the Director of Strategy and Policy Analysis at D uh, the Commission's DG Agri. We have Elsa Jalema, who is a dairy farmer and vice president of the cooperative board Friesland Campina. And we also have Katja Sedenschner, um, who is a sustainability director at Nestle. So I'd like to welcome our panellists, wherever they are, up to the floor. Stick shy. Um, yes, excellent. And I'll just say that we will have a Q&A session at the end of this panel session. So if you have any questions in mind, do keep them in your head as you go along. Um, and I'd also like to say what a, how refreshing... Yeah, absolutely, you can sit here. Um, how refreshing it is to have an all-women panel. This is very, it's very nice. It's quite unusual as well for me. So, yes, as Clara said earlier... <laughs> yeah. It's great to see, it's great to be a part of. So, very happy with that. Um, so, Catherine, let me turn to you first. I mean, we've just heard this story from Elizabeth's farm. Um, she was talking about all these ideas that she had, maybe didn't have the capital to do it, some of the struggles, some of the, you know, massive innovations that she's making. Um, I just want to know from your perspective, you know, what you, what you make of, of this story, and, you know, that I think it reflects maybe a lot of the struggles of some of the of European farmers. And also from your perspectives, you know, what do you see as the main roadblocks preventing the scale up of sustainable agriculture in the EU? I'll pass you the floor. Is that working? No. Uh, yes, it's Maybe it's because you have two mics, maybe. Sorry. Perhaps try now. Use two. Voila. Yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much and um, congratulations uh, for organizing, hosting this event on a very timely subject. Uh, I think it's uh, very important that we engage on these two questions. You know, how can we do a better job in delivering more sustainable and more resilient uh, food system? What are the tools? Um, we've started with a positive note, I think, uh, with uh, your testimony as a farmer on how you build your productivity as well as uh, building your sustainability and the resilience of your farm and preparing uh, for the future. Uh, so maybe before I answer your question, I'd like to say that uh, there are positive things happening in this sector. It's not to be complacent, but I think it's important to, to say it. First of all, we have a, we have a roadmap in Europe. Uh, we've set the direction. Uh, it is true to say that we haven't delivered already uh, everything, but we have started uh, to deliver. So here I'm referring obviously to the European Green Deal and its uh, farm to fork strategy. Um, that was including several initiatives on which we have delivered the new, the brand new cap, uh, which is greener, which is also taking into account more uh, in a better way also the diversity of our uh, agriculture and which uh, put more emphasis on climate uh, and uh, uh, environment and, and resilience. Um, and there are many other initiatives that are ongoing. Another good news also is that we already have millions of farmers who are already implementing practices which are better for the environment, better for the soil, um, that make them more autonomous and resilient. I'm not only thinking about organic farmers, obviously. This is one category of farmers who are doing a lot, but also those who are implementing, you know, um, whatever you call it, agroecological practices, regenerative agriculture, no-tilling practices. So all this uh, is happening. 
And, of course, I can say that we have already some results. They may not be enough, I'll come to that in a minute, but uh, we are, as far as I am aware, we are the only region in the world who has an agriculture that has delivered uh, or emitted uh, between 1990 and today less greenhouse gas uh, emission, uh, so that has reduced its greenhouse gas emission. Emissions. Of course, this is stagnating since 2010, but that needs to be said. And we've reduced also what we could call the carbon intensity of our farming system. So um, there are good things happening. But you're right, we need to step up our efforts. We need to do better. We need to scale up the transition. Why this has been said, extreme weather events, um, so climate change is now really impacting uh, agriculture the loss of biodiversity, all this is having an effect already on the short term and I would say on the long term on our ability to continue to produce our food. That is clear. So business as, new, as usual is not possible. We need also to recognize that agriculture has to, um, as a, to, to also contribute to climate change uh, mitigation. So that's very important. So what are the obstacles or the hurdles or the difficulties we are struggling with? Doesn't mean that this is not possible, but we are struggling with different things. As I see it, um, I would say that in a way the green revolution, the so-called green revolution that we had in the early 60s, was much simpler to implement that the, transition, the, the, the revolution in a way that we have to implement now. You know, this was uh, what I learned at school as an agronomist was rather simple, you know, simple recipes. And now it's becoming a bit more complex, more knowledge intensive, you know, more observation, more complex production systems. So that's a bit more difficult than just the single recipes that we uh, had learned. Second, it needs to, and that has been mentioned, we need um, to also recognize that farmers in isolation cannot deliver the transition. They can decide to be more sustainable and more resilient, but they cannot do it without talking to their suppliers and their customers. So we need to strengthen the dialogue between the different um, stages of the, of the food chain. I would say also another element which is not helping uh, and on which we can take action, uh, but I will come later maybe in the conversation on the action, demand... Um, uh, is not yet driving the transition. Uh, our diets are evolving, but they are not evolving very, very quickly, we should recognize. So that doesn't help uh, either. And um, those solutions exist. Um, change is always difficult. We know that in our life also. What's in it uh, for me if I change? What are the risks? Am I ready to take risks? So the risk linked to the transition is also something that can be a hurdle um, for change. And investments and new approaches are needed, which is sometimes also uh, something for which you need to be advised, trained, and you don't have the right skills. So these are elements on which uh, I think we need to work together. OK, thank you for that. Um, Elizabeth, perhaps let me turn to you now. Um, so maybe I can have your reflections on maybe um, what Catherine has, has, has just listed as the, the main roadblocks. But also, I wanted to pick up on this theme of generational renewal with you. Um, it was a theme that Clara mentioned in her opening remarks. Or as you spoke about the, the, new the next generation that's in the room with us today. Um, I'm wondering for you, what do you see as the main opportunities but also challenges that you see young farmers face in accelerating the sustainable transition and you know in, 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 in wanting to be interested in taking over farms how do we inspire the next generation we have like, uh, we have actually done our research in uh, sweden about this so we have asked uh, some hundred of young farmers or people that are into the branch uh, what they see as the biggest challenge mm -hmm. Uh, and 81% says lack of capital, okay. so that's very clear. Um, and 63% um, says that it's too expensive and not uh, profitable farming. 77% uh, says it's mentally stressful. Mm. 
Uh, and I think a lot of those things you can directly connect to uh, the climate change, of course. Uh, this is my first year as a farmer myself. I'm born on a farm and raised at the farm. So, of course, the, the rainy summers or the dry summers have always affected me in one way. But this year, when I'm a farmer myself and the milk should pay for my milk in the food store, um, I have never been so stressed about the climate ch change before as I'm today. So I think that's a huge uh, challenge for the farmers in the future uh, and also today. Uh, but of course, that's an opportunity as well, because we could do uh, a journey. We, and we are also the only branch that actually can uh, bind the carboxide when we produce. Uh, so I think that, of course, the climate change is a big uh, challenge. And uh, access to land. Uh, I mean, the only reason why I even could be a farmer right now is because my husband's parents was farmers. Uh, otherwise, you are not. It's impossible to buy a farm uh, if you're a young farm, if you're a young person, because you don't have the money. Uh, access to credit, you can connect that to access to land, and of course the profitability. If it should be more, uh, more money, the bank should have a different attitude. I think you should have different opportunities. Um, education and skills. I think that we need uh, more knowledge that are you can use direct at the field, because I mean, I'm an agronomist myself as well, but a lot of those things I learned at the university, I cannot really use it on the field. So I think that that may, may be need more knowledge. Um, and also that the people who have done the research ask, actually ask the farmers, what kind of problems do you have? What kind of solutions do you see at your farm? Uh, so we can make the research more uh, adapting to the reality. Um, so I think those are, those are some big challenges. And then uh, we could also see in this um, study that we made in Sweden that uh, the public attitude towards farmers uh, was 23% uh, thought that it was making agriculture unattractive. Mm. Uh, so I also think that we have to see farmers at, at the part of the solution and not only a part of the problem. Because I feel like what I'm doing in my work those days is the most uh, worthful I have ever been doing the whole time I have been working. Um, so I think that's um, something. And then, of course, you can also see you have some research where you can see that young farmers are more willing to do uh, sustainable investment than older farmers. And of course, if I have 40 more years of farming, of course, I'm more willing to invest than my father that may have 10 years left. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to see that young farmers are opportunity by themselves because we are willing to invest. We are having the future in front of us. And um, yeah, we just need, uh, we just need the capital. Mm. Yeah, it's impressive, impressive numbers that you, you mentioned there at the beginning, the 81%. Yeah. And, uh, very impressive. Um, OK, well... Let me bring Elsa in now. Um, perhaps you bring the perspective from the cooperative side of things. Um, could you kind of spell out for us, what, what do you see as the importance of collective organisations, such as farmers' cooperatives, to drive collaboration, to work together, to help support each other, um, and action on the ground, to, to, to drive action on the ground to accelerate the transition? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you uh, that I, um, I can be here. Um, I'm the vice chair of the cooperative and I recognize a lot of things you say because I'm a farmer by myself. But also as a vice chair of Friesland Campina, uh, we collaborate uh, a lot. Because Friesland Campina is a dairy cooperative that exists more than 150 years already. And through that cooperative, our member farmers are owner of the company. And that ownerships, that brings benefits but also a responsibility. We have 15,000 member dairy farmers on 10,000 dairy farms in the Netherlands, in Belgium, and in Germany. So that makes us a big cooperative and one of the largest of the world. And the farmers, the cooperative, and also the company aim to be significantly reduce our greenhouse gas uh, emissions by 2030 and try to produce net climate neutral not later than 2050. And that is a big challenge. Uh, but our members and also the employees of the company uh, will tackle this challenge 
uh, and referred by, di by di biodiversity losses. But, you know, if you are a cooperative, you have a lot of experience to work together. Work together with farmers, with partners, also with consumers. And I would like, in that view, three uh, points and highlight that three points. Because it is very important, and you said action on the ground is needed to tackle all these chances. Firstly, is that in our experience, it is very important to engage that farmer himself in policy making processes. Because that farmer is not, own, is not the problem. Sometimes we say he is the problem, but he is more part of the solution. And being part of the solution, that brings also opportunities. Secondly, um, it is very important and it is a fundamental role of the, um, uh, uh, the, the farmer to transform that food system. So a more positive tone of voice about farmers is very important because they, uh, in the end, are the persons and the, 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 the people that make the difference on the ground. And thirdly, um, it is the power of collaboration. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, we work together, um, not only as a public organization, but public and private organizations together can drive uh, that collaboration uh, in frameworks, in rewards. And we need that policy makers uh, to finance and transform the transition. That in the first round. I will. Yeah, we're playing, juggling with the microphones here. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for uh, for that intervention, Katia. Let me turn to you now. So you've been waiting very patiently behind me. Sorry, I've had my back to you. Um, Nestle has laid out this very ambitious roadmap to scale up uh, regenerative agriculture. Now, why is regenerative agriculture such a strategic point for Nestle? Um, and, and what do you see as the role of major food brands like Nestle in scaling up this transition? Where do you see your place here? Thank you. Um, yeah, so first maybe let me share with you why it's so important for us, why we are so committed behind uh, regenerative agriculture. Um, so what we call regenerative agriculture is bringing the best of different uh, names together. So it's not about the name, I think it's about the practices. Um, we are very committed because agriculture plays a hugely important uh, role, not just in terms of the raw materials and uh, in providing food as such, but as well when we look at uh, our climate ambition and what we want to achieve, 70% uh, of our emissions come from agriculture and has an impact not just on, uh, on carbon emissions, but as well water, quality, quantity, biodiversity, etc. So we really need to first understand and recognize that nature is the foundation of, uh, of our, our business. Uh, so we want to scale up regenerative agriculture uh, to have to source 20% by 2025 from regenerative agriculture. So we need that scale, and that's one of the challenges why we are, we are here. Um, so to, uh, to uh, shed a bit more light on why we do it. We do it because it makes sense not just for nature, it's not an uh, uh, anthropology uh, question, but it also makes sense for the farmer, uh, and it makes sense for us as, uh, as a food manufacturer. So it really makes commercial sense. Um, and if I may, I think it's always good to talk about tangible results and uh, where we are. So let me maybe share a few examples. Um, so first of all, I think um, we are scale we're trying to scale up uh, as much as possible. We have some very tangible results uh, on the ground, uh, be it both in terms of uh, soils projects, but also in terms of dairy. So good to see uh, Friesland Campina as well, so ambitious because it's one of our key suppliers as well. Um, so in Living Soils, this is one of the projects in, uh, in France that uh, some of you might know, where we get now to, uh, to 200 farms, 10 suppliers, and by the end of 22, we will be sourcing 72,000 tons of raw materials through regenerative agriculture. And there we collaborate with uh, different uh, parties to, to train the farmers, to give financial assistance, to make this uh, work. So this is one example. Then in the dairy sector, there's also very good uh, results in, uh, in Europe, but also outside of Europe. Uh, in Switzerland, for example, we work with uh, 46 farms and we can already see that uh, they can reduce emissions by, 20, by 10 percent in, uh, in Switzerland. Um, in the UK, we work with 90 farms 
And then in dairy uh, Spain, we are scaling up to 200 farms. So that's where we work directly with farmers, which seems to be much easier than working through suppliers. But where we work directly with farmers, we get, uh, we get quicker results. And there we aim to reduce emissions by uh, 18%. Um, and coming to my point about the, uh, the commercial, why it makes also commercial sense, let me give you some tangible examples from uh, a net zero farm that we have in South Africa. So there, um, to mention a few examples, um, we could increase milk production. Um, also, you were talking about the animal well-being and when the, when the cow is happy, there is more milk production as well. So we could increase milk production by 11% and that, on that farm. We could reduce methane emissions by 22% is quite impressive. We have 60% less chemical nitrogen use, which again has a positive impact on uh, water, etc. We have less water usage, um, less energy purchase, because as well we work with uh, solar panels, uh, etc. And we have increased, increased soil organic carbon. So when you look at that, also financially for the farmer after the transition, it really makes sense to, uh, to switch to regenerative uh, aquaculture. So the key thing is, is really about that transition and about the initial investment where we need some support financially, but as well uh, technically to, to train the farmers. Mm. Oh, sorry, do you mind? Oh, Switching off? On. Oh, yeah. There we go. We're going we're gonna to manage it <laughs> with the microphones. Um, Katia, let me just, on, on that point, I'm going to maybe just push you here. There's, when I speak to farmers... There is some criticisms coming from, you know, this new renewed interest in regenerative agriculture from, you know, major food brands such as Nestle. And one of the concerns is that maybe the criteria is not stringent enough about what regenerative agriculture is and, and what it's not. And also, you know, how this push translates into tangible action on the ground, um, you know, and how that value is shifted towards farmers. I'm just wondering, I just want to bring that farmer's perspective to you and put it to you. You know, how, how do we make this a tangible thing with stringent criteria so it's not, you know, a form of greenwashing is the, is the criticism. And I, I'm really interested to hear your take on that one. So I think, yes, it starts probably also from there to define what, what do we mean by that? Because unfortunately, there is no market. I think that's one of the challenges. Um, very often, you know, it would be easy if we can just, you know, buy a specific uh, raw material with, specific, uh, with specifications on the market. But there is no common standard definition of regenerative agriculture and there is no market. So when I talk to farmers, they say, well, we don't know that you want this. Um, if we could just know that you want this, then, you know, we would be uh, switching and then having the same standards as well, because Nestle is big, but we are just one of many uh, customers of the farmers. So we need to have some common alignment in terms of the definition, in terms of creating that market, and then as well, valorizing that and giving that uh, value. So from our side, we, we pay premiums, we, uh, we do trainings, we, we work with uh, different partners because the farmers need to work from farmers. They don't want Nestle to tell them what to do. They, they, they know that um, best by themselves. But we try to support uh, in, that, um, yeah, in, the, in that farmer's uh, transition through technical assistance, but also financial assistance. Yeah, a stringent definition. OK, interesting. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, Elizabeth, maybe I'll turn to you now. Uh, we've just heard, you know, from, from Nestle's side. I'm wondering, from your perspective, how agricultural value chain players and, and, and also policymakers can support um, young farmers like you more in this transition. Do you have anything to add, to add and reflect on what we just heard? <sighs> uh, I think that those... Uh, when the... Uh, those in-house brands, uh, they are pushing the price down even lower. And the retailers often buy the uh, lowest price products, which is even a lower price than the cost for it to produce. So that's a big uh, problem. And then actors in the middle of the supply chain still benefit from their position, or the farmers. So uh, this makes farmers to price takers and not the price setters. And I think that uh, if we would like to have some food production and if you would like to have some sustainable food, uh, it needs to, I mean, it costs to produce sustainable and someone needs to pay for that. And of course, a farmer could be a part of it, but uh, he or she can't do it by themselves. So I think that uh, that's a big problem, the, the position in the value chain. Mm -hmm. And then I think that maybe a long term contract which support young farmers in their installation. As I said before, when we do investment, I don't know what policymakers think in four years. Things change very quick. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I do an investment, we are looking in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So I think that's something that 
could be good and uh, like a risk sharing. Um, and then I also think that the better training and education programs uh, could uh, support young farmers. Like now we are paying advisors coming to our farm and uh, of course in 10 years maybe we can do it ourselves uh, and we are learning by doing but it's very costful. Um, so I think like the risk management uh, and maybe a more fair price for the product. I don't understand why food must be the cheap. Uh, people want cheap food, but no one wants it to be produced cheap. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big uh, challenge we have to discuss and see who should pay for, for the costs. Uh, yeah. Just stealing your microphone there so I can speak. Um, Elsa, perhaps I'll bring you in also on this point and, and maybe mm -hmm. to expand a bit on, on well, the same, the same point, but also the challenges you face in supporting your member uh, farmers in the transition and how public policies can also support them. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, Friesland Campina, we have a quality and sustainable, uh, sustainability programme that is called Focus Planet. And it consists of basic requirements that all farms need to comply with. And also, it is a system that is result-based and it is an incentive program. And it rewards farmers for their positive results that they deliver individually on animal welfare, climate and bio biodiversity. And that is very uh, important for especially also young farmers because there is a path uh, to going forward. Um, in my experience as farmers by myself, but also the experience of Friesland Campina, is that uh, the most effective way to uh, transform? Reward on result and support, and support farmers. So what we don't do is tell what they have to do, but we let them choose in uh, uh, f farming uh, perspectives, uh, farming um, uh, uh, practices, and uh, let them choose their in, and let them choose what the best suit is for their farm, on their local uh, context, uh, with their entrepreneurship, and also their own craftsmanship. And I know when I'm telling this to you as uh, policy makers uh, that it is a challenge. But um, because, it is a challenge because you need a lot of data in place and you need also a strong assurance system. But if you want to scale up future fit farming, you need to give perspective and also that re rewards to the, to the farmers. So that is what we're trying to do as Friesland Campina, together with partners as Nestle. But we cannot do that on ourselves and alone. So we need, therefore, uh, all of you. Um, and it requires efforts from all of us. So not only the farmers, not only the business, but also the consumers, producers, suppliers, retailers, banks, and also the governance uh, that is needed. And what we see, and that's uh, a little bit a problem, but I think we can solve it together, is that um, if you work on reward programs now and result-based programs with incentives, uh, that that not always do resonate with uh, the European policies uh, at this moment. So I will ask the uh, policy makers to also help to uh, encourage and, and uh, make reward programs um, that will give energy on the ground and give perspective to the young uh, farmers uh, because that is needed to make the difference and the transformation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, talking of putting questions to policymakers about how to action on the ground, <laughs> Catherine, I will turn to you now. So you oversee, um, you know, the Agricultural Policy Analysis Unit, which includes the Common Agricultural Policy. Now, earlier, Pascal called this a legacy policy. He said there's not enough room in this for the radical change that's required for the support that is needed for farmers. Um, you know, of course, this cap reforms only just come into play, but, you know, how, how can this, can this policy support agricultural transitions, what is needed in the future for this policy? Is there space perhaps for this 
ETS scheme or something that, like Pascal mentioned in his opening remarks, I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts about whether this policy is up, up to the challenge. So thank you very much. So the short answer to your question is yes, the common agricultural policy is definitely uh, supporting uh, the transition. Uh, maybe there is a need to work better together to see how we can further help. But maybe to broaden a bit the question, indeed, the, there are many EU policies, not only the CAP, uh, supporting uh, farmers in their transition. So starting with the CAP, obviously, the brand new CAP that we've been implementing since the 1st of January is uh, important because you have a lot, a higher level of conditionality and more important share of the budget, which is dedicated to incentivize farmers to adopt, you know, practices which are more positively impacting on the environment and the climate. There is also a feature of this new CAP which is important, which is the uh, CAP strategic plan, where um, first we recognize that agriculture um, might be facing, though we all need to be more resilient and more sustainable, we might face different challenges in different regions of Europe and different countries, which is important, I think. And this approach where you look at your strengths and your weaknesses, your needs, your expectation, and then you tailor with your CAP strategic plan, you know, you use the toolbox of the CAP to support um, your uh, policy priorities is certainly uh, something that goes into the right direction. Too early to say, of course, what this will deliver. It's a couple of months after we've started to implement it, so let's be patient. Uh, and see, because it's a performance-based uh, cap, uh, in 2025, we have to be patient, you know, the first result uh, and impact that it will have. Um, it's not just about the cap, obviously. Um, uh, we also support uh, investment, and I know this will be the main focus of the second panel, so maybe I do not expand too much here, but that's important to recognize that this transition um, is so, um, is, is so uh, important. Is such, there is such a shift to do that we will need to invest more uh, in our farming system and more in our food chain. So that is recognized, obviously, in the second pillar of the cap for uh, the, the farmers, and maybe much more will need to be done. Let's look at that. But not only in the cap, you have also other investment programs which are important at uh, EU level, uh, which are, let me mention in particular, Next Generation EU, um, the work, uh, what the uh, InvestEU, uh, what the EIB also is doing, uh, which is more focused, obviously, to um, uh, the other part of the food chain, if I may put it that way, and which is important, uh, obviously. And here, the objective of... Um, uh, this investment program is not to, of course, replace the private investment that will be needed, but just to help, support, steer, and uh, indicate what is the, the right direction. Then, of course, research and innovation is important. I will, not give, I will not bombard you with figures, but I think it's important. Though I said we, maybe, maybe I didn't say it, we already have many solutions to transition. So it's not that we need um, you know, to wait until we have more innovation, more technologies. We already have a lot of solutions, but still we know that this transition will, um, um, will also um, um, be more effective if we provide some innovation, new tools to, to our farmers and to our food chain. Uh, and last but not least, maybe to say that, um, and that may echo a bit what uh, Pascal Canfin was saying at the beginning. We have started working on carbon farming, uh, which is an important initiative for which for the moment we are only, but that's the first step, which I believe is an important one, looking at the methodology uh, to measure carbon sequestration, which is the first step. And then we we'll see what we can do, because this is about also how can we better reward uh, what uh, the farming sector and maybe also foresters can do. They can, this is the only sector um, or the, 
maybe I can put it that way, it's the only human activities where you can really sequestrate uh, carbon. So why don't we uh, build a system where we reward that? And of course, you could build on the cap, the next cap maybe with eco schemes, for example, but you could also imagine, and here we have to be creative, you could imagine also to look at how the private sector and market could better reward uh, uh, farmers uh, for that. So I don't want to undermine, obviously, coming from DG Agri, that would be uh, very weird. Uh, I don't want to undermine the role of the CAP. The CAP is, I think, an important policy. But in isolation to um, the many other initiatives that are ongoing or that we could imagine at EU level, it will not be sufficient to achieve our objectives. So let's also look at the uh, overall policy mix and make sure that you know, we um, help you as policymakers with you know, a set of tools and levers so that you can deliver the uh, transition. Because it's you delivering the transition and we are not going to deliver it. It's you. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. I do want to open the floor for questions, but I would like to ask you one quick question also. Um, last week, although it feels like longer ago, but it was last week, the State of the Union speech. Commission, Pre uh, Commission President von der Leyen announced the launch of this strategic dialogue on the future of agriculture. And we're talking about, we're talking about looking at the future, how we can support our farmers here. I just wonder if you have a word on what this means concretely for the, for the sector. I think everyone has that question on their lips. Perhaps you could help um, us understand what that means. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come back to that because uh, I guess as uh, with the farming community, we are uh, also um, um, very uh, proud of the, the reference to the importance of this sector. We knew it, of course, on this side of the table, we knew it, but that's good uh, to, to be recognised as, as such. Um, it is a bit early for me to tell you exactly how we are going to operationalise this strategic dialogue. But just let me say that we want to engage with the farming community um, in the coming months, um, but not only with the farming community. Eh? We don't want to lose, I think it is important, and here there is nothing negative, eh? but we don't want to lose this food value chain approach. We need more alignment of all of us. So uh, the different stages of the food chain as well as policymakers. I think this is maybe what we've missed. So we, we are preparing, cooking, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of uh, important initiatives where we will engage at all levels, both with farmers as well as with the other key economic um, stakeholders of a, the, the food chain, so as to imagine together the uh, future of our farming se sector and beyond, of course, of our food system. So that's going to be a great opportunity before we look then at the different policy uh, tools that we, uh, we can build together. Coming months, like it will be launched before the end of the year? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. OK. All right. Good answer <laughs> on that one. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our panellists. I'd now like to open the floor to questions. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to put to our panellists? Please say who you are when you put your question and say who your question is for and try and keep them nice and concise. Does anyone have any questions? Or have I covered all the bases? We have one at the back. You're going to have to find a microphone. Maybe you can borrow one. Yes. Uh, just a quick question: How many farmer is in the room now? We've had just how many farmers, raise your hand by, by a show of hands. Uh, how many farmers do we have here? Okay, and so I have uh, another question. Um, uh, for first, I want to thank you to bring those uh, beautiful person here. Um, but um, I have a question for all of you. In fact. Is, I'm asking if the European democracy could uh, help, uh, in fact, since um, they don't know the reality of farmer. That's what I think. Um, for the example, the bio label um, um, is really uh, something heavy for farmer that use it. You know, in fact, and it, it's a stressful. Uh, um, yeah, it's really stressful for them. And I think when Europe tried to, 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 yeah, to, to, to control the market, sometimes it makes something that you cannot control, in fact. 
and beer for that is really f it, it's it's a uh, it's awful I know you know for me. Um, so um, I'm asking how we could have a, a real democratic uh, way to hear and help farmer because for me. Uh, we lose a lot of farmer every minute in Europe. So how can the Europe can really help them? Because uh, you know, even conventional farmer, we need them today. We really need them today. I know a lot of young people like me that try to uh, to, to to earn money with agriculture, and some of them they suicide themselves. So the question is how you can help help us, help me, help, help my children to have like a real system for uh, feed the Europe. And I think at the beginning, uh, the biology, uh, the, the, the organic farming was a really good idea. But then industry and some of, the, they, they changed the way of, of the philosophy and Europe don't help for that. Okay, okay, so <clears throat> who would like to take this question? It was put to the whole, to the whole panel. Does anybody want to jump on that question, Catherine? Have your hand, yeah? Or uh, Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, so I think there are many questions in your questions. So maybe on what you call the democratic process, I think it's the, I can say that um, the fact that uh, we've decided to engage with the farming community uh, on the future of farming is significant. Of course, this will be a process that will um, not just um, happen for a couple of months. Of course, this, there will be a focus in the next, in the upcoming months, so as to prepare the future of our EU policies, and in particular the common agricultural policy. But I think that we pay more and more attention as policymakers to consult with those who are um, um, in the ground, in the field. So I would like to encourage you and those you are working with to join what we are going to do in a way which is, we will try to do it in a, in a way which is innovative and very also um, uh, inclusive. So meaning not just meetings in Brussels, but also meetings in member states uh, at regional level, at local level. That would be my first comment. Then when it comes to labeling um, um just let me let me say i'm, I'm not commenting on, on what you're saying organic farming uh, has uh, brought a lot of uh, added uh, value uh, to um, uh, to our society to our food chain to uh, this is also a demand from consumers um, these farmers were also pioneer already anticipating the importance of you know nurturing uh, nature, natural resources to be able on the long term. You said something which is very important, which is we also need conventional agriculture, yes, and we need conventional agriculture to move to more sustainable and resilient practices. That's very important. And then when it comes to labeling in general, I think that we need to find ways that might not be labeled, but we need also to find ways to better evaluate and communicate um, what farmers are doing in Europe and what the food chain is doing in Europe. I think it's, it's critical to be able to better uh, communicate to our consumers that even... Ali, I'm going to try to say it that way. The, the very cheap food product that you buy already in Europe is something where you have not just food quality, food safety, but also animal welfare rules, protection of the environment, and so on and so forth. And that may be, I like this, this noise, you know. <laughs> Thank you for bringing, you know, the future to us. Um, so I think here there is something also that maybe we should reflect all together how we are going to bring all this information in an easier and more accessible way uh, to our consumers so that uh, the market can better reward also the efforts of farmers. Thank you for that. Um, Elizabeth, did you want to come in? I can see you writing away. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree with you totally. In Sweden, only 2% of, of the population are farmers. 
So when I tell my friends about my life, they get me surprised, those who aren't from a farm. Uh, and I'm very glad that I'm here and able to spe share my story today. Um, I think it's very important that young farmers get invited. And I think, therefore, we have a shared responsibility. The young farmers have to tell their story and uh, someone has to listen to them. Um, and when it came to organic, we have been organic uh, till the last of December this year. We're going to be non-organic next year. And it's not because I don't believe more or less in something of it. It's that we need a market. Because now, even if we get better support by the CAP, if we're organic, it's not covering the extra costs. So I think that uh, if you are, if you are want, to, if we have to um, find solutions for that so, so society we are want to go through. Um, and right now, at least for us in my company, uh, we we don't afford to be organic because it costs more than we get from it. Um, and this with mental health, as you mentioned, and I, as I mentioned before as well, it is very stressful to be a farmer. Uh, we have been discussing this in CISHA as a topic, and um, I, I look very, very serious on that, uh, and hope that we can find solutions uh, forward. Thank you. Oh, we've got hands. <laughs> uh, yes, would you like to put a question? Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Michael Pilke. I'm also from DG Agri. And maybe a comment on the uh, statement on organic farming labeling. Of course, I think organic farming is complex because I think the, the processes are complex and therefore the, the rules are not easy. But maybe you should not underestimate the big added value of the European organic logo. You provide really confidence to the uh, uh, consumer because we have a very sophisticated control system which is also audited uh, by, by, by commission auditors. We have a system uh, related to imports. We have uh, agreements with, with, with third countries on, on what is organic and, and not. And I think uh, this is a, a, an, an asset for a market which, which we should not underestimate. What is genera regenerative farming? What if a consumer gets a product, this is produced uh, with re regenerated farming? Mm -hmm. Everybody's, everybody may have a different understanding. And of course, everybody also has a different understanding of organic farming. But here we have a codex. We have something in, in, in which, which is reliable, which doesn't change this may be the policy of a company. Mm. And I think this was complex, and I think uh, people in the room who were in the negotiations know that people were really trying to find compromises, to find something which is acceptable for different organic farmers, for different uh, parts of the sector, and, and, and also consumers and, 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 and other stakeholders. So uh, please don't, uh, how to say, don't bash <laughs> the, the organic farming logo and forget uh, the, the achievements and, and, and what you've got. So Thank I you. think your question has sparked some quite interesting debates going on here. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do have to bring this panel session to a close, and I'm very sorry about that because it's a very interesting topic. But um, there is a coffee break ha that was going to be happening af right after the event. So if you want to continue these discussions and continue with policymakers and everyone else, I think everyone would welcome that. I would be interested to hear the discussion as well. But unfortunately, I'm going to have to bring this to a close. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I we'll thank all of our panellists for bringing these very interesting insights and sparking a very interesting and insightful debate. Um, and I would like to invite you all to take your seats and then I will open at this second panel session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes, as I said, we're now moving on to our second panel discussion today, which is on unlocking agricultural investment for the sustainable transition. So what would an investment package to finance the transition at scale look like? These are the kind of questions we're going to be exploring. And I'd like to welcome Michael Pilke, who's already introduced himself from DG Agri, um, to set the scene for us and share with us some insights into the work already underway. So, Michael, let me pass the floor to you. Yeah, I didn't expect to sit here all alone, but uh, let's start. 
Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for the invitation. And uh, I think from the first panel, we all understand how important it is to support the transition which is based on investments, but not only investments. I think we have also learned in the first panel that a lot, is all, a lot of it is also based on uh, practices, on knowledge, on change of consumer demand, and this all together will only bring us to, to a, a transition in a sustainable food sector, hopefully, not only a sustainable agriculture, because a sustainable agriculture alone will not do the trick, because we all know how agriculture, processing, retail sector, how important those interlinkages are. And we have also learned the contribution of the CAP, which has started in 2023 with a new concept, reinforcing the uh, sustainable part. And I think for us is also one cornerstone are young farmers, because we believe that young farmers, also well-trained, motivated, living in rural areas, that they are very much important to drive this transition. And you know, I'm, uh, in my title it's said uh, Acting Director for Sustainability. Many people think sustainability is only about environment. No. In my directorate there are three units. Economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, social sustainability. And I think this is something which we should never forget. We need uh, all these aspects. We need food security, but we also need food affordability. You know the discussion uh, linked to the inflation. We need to always look at, at all those aspects together. And this brings me to the challenges for the farming sector and young farmers and also the challenges to come with investments in, to improve sustainability. Young farmers in specific, we have heard the difficulties to have access to land. Land prices are high and access to credit is oft missing and not easy. But also here, we should not limit the focus only on the sector, only on these elements, because a young farmer is not alone. There's also family around. And attractiveness to become a young farmer is not only a high cereal price or a, a good access to a loan. It's, it's also, do we still have vib vibrant rural areas? Is there infrastructure? Is there internet? Is there social infrastructure? Yeah, I think uh, this all together we have to see. So I always plead not for a narrow focus, but look a bit, all this has to be addressed. And I think that's also why I believe that with the CAP strategic plans, we have created a powerful tool. Because in the CAP strategic plan, you have everything together. You have measures to support the economic, sustainability, income support, competitive investments in competitiveness. You have measures linked to environmental sustainability, also investments. You have the whole part linked to uh, social sustainability, to knowledge transfer. You have everything together. The member states has a budget, and the task of the member states is to come up with a strategy to find an intelligent way to come to a transition to more sustainable agriculture. And as I said, sustainability in a broader sense. What do I mean if when I say that we have challenges with, uh, with the access to capital? We did a, a, a study uh, with our counterpart, Phi Compass. This is a, 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 a brand of uh, the uh, EIB, a department of the EIB, which, we, uh, which helps us to improve access to capital. So we had a study on that, 
in uh, 2020. And the result is that we estimate the gap in bank financing for the EU agriculture between 20 and uh, 47 billion euro. So there's a huge gap, a huge need for financing to do the necessary investments. We are updating the study and we, we expect that the gap with all what's happened in the meantime will rather increase. How do we come to those figures? What do we mean with financial gap, access to capital? So we have made a survey. We have asked farmers in several member states, but we have also done a service with the food sector. And um, this calculation is based on the concept that projects have been refused, either refused by banks, or the company or the farmer hasn't submitted because they already anticipate that, uh, that there will be no loan. It's not a new, new, it's not a, a new phenomenon. So we have this since, since years and we try to mitigate this and I come to our measures later. So what are the main stumbling blocks when it comes to finance in agriculture? Young farmers account for 30% of the total financing gap, so 7 to 13 billion euro. And I think therefore we also welcome the Comagri resolution uh, general renewal in the EU farms because this has again uh, pointed out the difficulty. High interest rate, difficulty to get a loan, and also the need to have more knowledge in finance. And I think we, with our financial instruments, they can help in this situation, because with our financial instruments, we uh, offer periods where the farmers don't have to, to reimburse. We offer longer maturities, offer combination with grants and so on. Another group which has difficulties in, in obtaining a loan or credits are small farms. They are half of the gap, 14 to 35 million, billion euros, and also innovative uh, businesses face difficulties. If you look at the characteristic of those uh, difficulties, you see that two thirds of the gap are attributed to long-term loans, because longer term, also a higher risk is anticipated. So banks have difficulties to provide loans with, uh, which go beyond 10 to 12 years. But we all have heard from farmers that uh, to, to, to get the, the revenue out of an investment, you need sometimes a longer period. What we also learned from this survey is that uh, lack of sufficient collaterals, poor hi credit history, or lack of any cre credit history for young farmers, or weak business planning and management capacities are also those difficulties the small and young farmers uh, face. Sometimes also the, the loan conditions offered by banks are not at all attractive and are not suited for farming, and one example was the maturity. Agricultural loans is also still a quite uh, a specialized business. You need a lot of knowledge to assess whether an uh, uh, investment project in agriculture is viable and brings return or not. So we have in some member states only two or three bank or groups of banks who provide those loans. And you know if uh, you only have a limited number of providers, this can also lead to some difficulties that the uh, conditions are not so favorable. That's also something where we need to, to overcome, where we need to provide help to farmers to obtain uh, conditions which are suited to them. A 
As I said, we also did this exercise for the agri-food sector, and there we found a financing gap to, to up to 12.5 12 billion euro. So also in the uh, agri-food sector, which is also very much dominated from, for, uh, for, by SMEs, the smaller processors also face uh, difficulties. So we have in our, under the CAP, we program financial instruments. So we have 12 member states who provide this, this, this tool. And uh, um, we have a funding of around 1 billion euro, public funding. But the advantage of financial instruments is we, for example, we provide guarantees to, 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 to banks. They hand out the loan to the farmers. The farmers pay the loan back, and we can reuse the guarantee, which is much more efficient than a grant. And so far, we, we, can, we have a good, uh, good uh, uh, leverage e effect. Yeah, currently, we run 31, fi 31 uh, financial uh, instruments, uh, which a budget of 860 million euros. So, and we want to have more, and we want to provide incentives and help to managing authorities, public authorities, to provide more of those instruments to overcome those difficulties we, we face in the market. Loans conditions not tailor-made to agriculture, or specific situation of, of, of farmers uh, where, the, where the banks are hesitating to take the risk. Thank you, Michael. If I can maybe ask you just to wrap up that, that, that thought and then we can move on to the Thank you for your attention. And I'm looking oh, for, for a fruitful discussion. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Nicely wrapped up, nicely wrapped up. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for that comprehensive opening and overview of what we're about to discuss. And I would now like to welcome the other panellists. Michael's going to stay with us, but the other panellists uh, up to the floor. And so I'd like to welcome Peter Miedendorp, who is the uh, newly elected president of the young, EU Young Farmers Association, SEJA. We have Nicoline van Gerevink, who is the um, executive director of Food System Transformation at Rabo. Bank. We also have Guillaume um, Bucula, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Livelihood Funds, and Eric Soberant, who is the Managing Director of Unilever, um, the Climate and Nature Fund. So welcome to the floor. If you'd like, maybe like this side. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, Peter, perhaps let me start with you here. Um, we've just heard a, a number of challenges that Michael has raised um, when it comes to financial risks and, and different issues for farmers. Perhaps from your perspective, what do you see as the main financial risks for farmers to transition to sustainable agriculture? Do you have anything to add? Anything from your personal experience? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, well, um, investing into farming is a, a rather risky uh, business uh, nowadays and from a historical perspective that's uh, actually quite unique uh, agriculture was normally uh, safe assets in banks but also private uh, uh, investors portfolios uh, interest rates were uh, slightly slower than other sectors and banks were uh, relatively happy to invest into agriculture but since the last decade, uh, we see that the willingness to invest in the agriculture sector has uh, been getting lower uh, and it, I think it says a lot about the risk distribution in the value chains. Um, interest rates do not lie. Uh, they simply tell us how risky a certain business is um, and which are less profitable investments. And the reason why banks or other actors uh, hesitate to invest in farms nowadays uh, and in agriculture is because we have been seeing farming become a more risky venture. Um, there are multiple reasons for that. There's no, no, no silver uh, 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 villain to blame. Uh, it's due to uh, weather and climate change conditions, uh, environmental factors, uh, but also the market prices, which has been quite up and down uh, last uh, years specifically. Uh, input costs, regulatory changes, and the general perception of the future of the sector. Uh, and also uh, the confidence of young farmers in uh, uh, their entrepreneurial choices uh, has been impacted uh, by this specifically. Um, 
and moreover, uh, we all talk about the need for sustainability, and uh, uh, we're the last one to say that uh, this is not absolutely necessary. Uh, as we all saw the climate events um, last summer. Uh, but as a union, we fail to define the transition paths for farmers and also the um, uh, definition of sustainability, uh, as the uh, last panel also uh, referred to. Um, as a result, it is very difficult for farmers, but also for uh, investors, to de 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 determine uh, the right investment and to make uh, at farm level. Uh, which also re will return in a, in a result uh, of that specific um, investment. And since there is no set of uh, definition on sustainability, uh, uh, the way we value sustainability can still change uh, perception, which makes it a more risky um, uh, thing to um, invest in, uh, resulting in, a, in uncertainty and consequently higher interest rates uh, that we are currently seeing. And um, I think it's not just our problem, it should be all of our problems, uh, because uh, if we're making investing in agriculture so risky, it's impossible for young farmers to um, invest in agriculture, to take over in farms, to make investments for uh, their sustainable farms. Um, and eventually, this will also ri uh, risk the supply of the quality and the quantity of food. Um, so th the supply of this is ultimate, ultimately at risk. Nicoline, perhaps this is a good moment to turn to you. Um, w what do you make of what we've just heard there? You know, what role can banks play in de-risking uh, the transition, in your opinion? Yes, thank you. And thank you, Peter. I think you, uh, you explained it very well. Uh, I, I think that's uh, definitely in line with uh, what we see at, uh, at Rabobank. Um, but yeah, Rabobank uh, also wants to, um, uh, to accelerate the transition. Uh, obviously, we're, we're facing the same uh, challenges as, uh, as other private sector players. Uh, we, uh, we also want to reduce our emissions uh, and uh, accelerate uh, regenerative uh, practices. Uh, but we're also uh, a farmer's bank. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's not always easy... Uh, to, uh, to be able to understand the risks and, and, uh, and to finance that. Um, I think there's two main ways that Rabobank uh, or other banks can play a role. Uh, uh, it's, it's finance, uh, obviously, and access to finance. Uh, but then uh, we need to understand the risks. We need to understand uh, the, the... We have to have visibility on the cash flows after transition because... The thing is, we're not a government, we're a bank, so it's, we're putting on debt or, or, or selling debt, and debt needs to be repaid, and that's just, uh, uh, that's just the, the reality. So we need to really uh, be able to assess the risks, be able to assess visibility on the cash flows, and therefore the perspective of the farmer. And I think you know, we could play a really uh, important role in bridging the difficult years when you switch to, uh, to more uh, organic or regenerative agriculture. It takes a few years before, uh, before the farmer uh, uh, is maybe benefiting, if, if at all, because even that is under, under discussion, of course. And if after these years uh, uh, it, the, the, the cash flows are better than before, yeah, there's a, there's a business case for, uh, for a bank to play a role. Because ultimately, that is the role of banks, is to, is to mirror cash flows. So in the years that someone doesn't have cash flows, you can use finance to bridge it. And in the years that you do, you can do the repayments. So I think that visibility is very important. What are we financing and how long is it going to take uh, before uh, uh, it can be repaid? Another very important role for banks is, uh, is the same as the rest of the private sector, is, uh, is to incentivize the, uh, the right practices. Uh, and that we can do through uh, interest rate discounts. So at Rabobank, we have this sustainability matrix where we uh, uh, look at uh, the sustainability profile of a, of a farmer or another client. Uh, and when they reach a certain level, then they get an interest rate discount. But that's not going to... Uh, uh, it's gon not going to be enough. So you need to stack these incentives. Uh, an interest rate discount can only be part of it. A subsidy and uh, um, an eco uh, scheme in the in the cap is another uh, incentive, and then uh, a premium by an off taker is another incentive. 
And we have a really nice example uh, between uh, in a partnership with uh, Rabobank and McCain. Uh, McCain has a, a very comprehensive framework for uh, for potato farmers uh, to uh, to switch to more regenerative practices. And we have looked at their framework and compared it to our matrix and said, yes, that's kind of the same, uh, the same that we uh, uh, think is sustainable. Uh, so there uh, is a message to the farmer. If you, if you adopt these practices, your bank is going to give you an interest rate discount on your existing loans. And then uh, uh, your off-taker uh, is also uh, offering a, a premium. And these kind of uh, partnerships are, I think, very important uh, uh, to, to start and then learn if it makes a difference uh, for the farmer to, uh, to switch. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Eric, let me turn to you now. This, uh, the concept of regenerative agriculture has come up many times, just heard it mentioned there and again in the, in the previous panel. Um, you have laid out, Unilever has laid out this ambitious roadmap to scale up regenerative agriculture across the supply chains. And that's what we're talking about here. Um, and this requires some su substantial investments, presumably. So uh, from your perspective, how do you create a revenue system that remunerates farmers in a sustainable but long-term way? I'm talking about throughout the, the, the whole course of the transition here. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think, of course, the, the transition is, is really of the essence of this debate. And, and, and there is really the G-curve a bit that we are all describing, which is that regenerative practices helps you to restore something that is fundamental, and by the way, that is very much there, which is the soil health. And without soil, there is no life, and without life, there is no agriculture. So you, it's very important, and, and basically, uh, we need to invest into these critical assets. And, and one thing that is very interesting when you think about financing is the fact that the more you invest in this asset, the more it is valorized. Usually an asset, as soon as you invest it, is depreciating. Nature, when you invest on nature, it's valorizing. And by the way, this itself is a way to capture incredible value that the system is not allowing today. So that's, that's one of the fundamental points in the G-curve that we all have to, to finance. And, and I have also personal and family interest in farming to answer to the gentleman before. And that's something that strikes me. You know, I, I, very early in my career, I remember exchanging with some farmers that say, OK, the full problem I have uh, is uh, basically I am living poor to die rich because I'm putting everything in an asset that is not liquid. And I think that's something that is very important when we think about farming. So the thing that we can do in Unilever, and that's why we've created the Climate and Nature Fund, which is a, a 1 billion euro budget allocation that we are deploying over 10 years, is to basically simply put uh, uh, money behind uh, where our mouth is and where our words here, and to say, OK, we have a role to play to make sure we are catalyzing our value chain, meaning our suppliers, but also co-financers, into trying to basically finance this G-curve and creating a new, uh, a new system. So what do we mean by that? We are looking at three very important criteria in the project we are financing. First, we are looking if uh, a regenerative agriculture program is going to bring more resilience for the farmer. I think this is the first criteria that we are looking at. It's not for Unilever, it's for the farmer. And actually, it's also for Unilever. Because as you know, we are producing mustard. And if you were living in France or in Europe last year, there were no mustard on the market during the summer. And this is directly an impact, not, an, not of the Ukraine war, but also of the drought in Eastern Europe and, and, and in Canada. So this is affecting some of our products. So resiliency is the first element. And we are deploying programs as we speak, for instance, in Spain at large scale, where we are transitioning our tomato farming production to regenerative agriculture. And guess what? Our yield have been stable over the last two years, despite basically the massive drop that we've seen. So we see tangible results that bring resilience and protect the yield for, for, for our farmers and at the end, the capacity of Unilever to produce good soup. And that's, that's, that's important when you love soup like I do, for instance, especially tomato soup. But, but, uh, uh, but that's, 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 uh, that's uh, uh, without joke, this is very important. First element, resilience. Second element is additionality. And I think I want to I build on what our colleagues said today, which is there are already a lot of things happening. And we know we need more. So we need to look at if the program we are going to, to develop is additional and going to go one step further. So that's another very important criteria of selection of, 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 uh, of a program. And the third one is, is the impact, right? 
uh, I have the chance and I've managed businesses along uh, many years in my career. Now I'm working for sustainability. And what I said to my team is my currency is impact. It's not dollars anymore. So I need to be able to make sure that I'm quantifying the impact that I'm, that I'm, that I'm producing. So these are three criteria on which we are looking at programs. With the two examples I gave you, so we see the G-curve and how this can protect basically the yield uh, of the farmers. And, and, and I think there is one, one dimension that we are starting to work on, which I think is also um, uh, something that probably can help us to bridge some of the, the complexity of the topic. Uh, and, I, and I don't know if, if Peter would agree, but there is this old logic of yield, 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 which of course is very important. But I think, to your point, we are trying to look at revenue per hectare. I think we need to change the lenses we are looking at. Because you can also bring more value added if you are thinking about the revenue per hectare. And in some of our programs, for instance, uh, in the Midwest of the US, in soy, this is something we are looking at. It's, uh, and of course, yield is a component of it, but it's not the only component. And then you enter to the discussion of what type of premium you are ready to pay for what type of practices change, to make sure that the revenue per hectare, so on the assets that the farmer has to finance, is increasing. And that's, that's another way of looking at this dimension, and that's the type of, 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 of ways we are trying to structure our program around. Okay, thank you for that. Peter, I will come back to you on that point, but actually let me bring Guillaume in first and then perhaps we can have the perspectives from both. Um, so Guillaume, at Livelihood f uh, Funds, you've ha you have experience in designing these collective landscape projects, right? Bringing in these different financial actors to fund projects to restore um, and regenerate, regenerate soils and, and land. I'm wondering if you could maybe outline what the main challenges were that you faced when seeking funding for these kind of projects in Europe. What, what were the kind of ra main roadblocks there? Well, thank you, Natasha. Um, we, with the funds we have, we invest uh, with farmers. Uh, we don't lend money. We don't lend money for capex or working capital for whatever. We invest with, with farmers. We invest directly within the transition itself. Because, <clears throat> of course, farmers need capex. But when we talk about trans transition, they need support. And I would like to echo what uh, Catherine said. A farmer, how did you phrase it? A farmer in isolation is not able to deliver a transition. That is certainly true. We have a project, for example, in Brittany, uh, which we visited many times. We have other projects in, in, in Northern Europe. And when you speak with the farmers who are engaged in the transition, which they call conservation agriculture, uh, and when we tell them, is it working? They say, yes, it's working. It's working. My yields are roughly the same. I use less uh, fertilizer, less pesticides. I don't need a big tractor anymore because it's no-till. I'm saving money, I'm saving time, and one of them also even, even told me I'm, I'm even able not to work over the weekends. That's wonderful. Anyway, so I asked them, why don't more farmers step uh, with you in this journey? They said there are many reasons, of course, but one very important reason he underlined was, look, this transition is a complete mindset practice change. My field, I, do, I don't till my field anymore. And when I'm speaking with my neighbors, my uncles, my cousins, whoever, not engaged in this transition, they tell me, but why is your field dirty? The field is dirty. It's considered dirty, right? So you will tell me, I'm not a farmer, there are some farmers in the room, what you think about that, but it was very clear. So they are somehow ostracized and left on the sides. So in this particular case, they managed the transition thanks to a couple of pioneers who started 30 years ago, tried and failed and tried and failed, and now they are 40. And one interesting thing that they told me as well is that in one year, since we are 40, in one year we can do 40 experiments. So this is what we invest in. We invest, we try to find farmers, groups, uh, who already tried something and who have the ability to embark, to engage with more, more farmers, more, more colleagues. They need support. So I will deliberately not speak a lot about loans and banks. I will try to find another angle. So they need support and, at least in France, uh, we have to admit that we need more 
we need to renew, to refresh the skills of uh, the staff of uh, chambers of agriculture and cooperatives. Uh, not all of them are open or skilled, even as much as they might like, they, they don't. Uh, so that's, that's an investment where that needs to, um, that clearly needs to take, to take place. Then, um, farmers are producing, um, echoing a bit what, what Eric said, let, maybe let's get out of the yield uh, uh, indicator and let's get to the to the revenue per hectare indicator. Now farmers are producing wheat, corn, whatever. They are producing private goods. We ask them to produce public goods, biodiversity, water preservation, carbon sequestration in the soil, public goods. How can we ask them, tell them to produce public goods and to just Tell them, look, well, I mean, change your practice, right? It's easy. You have, you have everything you need. So we need a new business model. I mean, and somebody, spoke, yeah, Katya, you said there's no market. There's actually no market. That's the definition of, of market failure. Nobody, is, nobody knows exactly who's going to pay for these externalities. So there probably the uh, uh, public sector needs to step in. Uh, we, we've had a few experiences with EU funding in a couple of projects in Europe. Uh, we, I'm confident we will manage to get that in one case on behalf of the farmers, with the farmers, with long forms uh, and many questions. But it's too cumbersome for them, it's too long uh, uh, to, um, to get the funding and too short the funding, it, the funding itself. And this relates to another topic and perhaps that should I should I should stop after that comment to another topic of the definition of sustainable agriculture regenerative agriculture uh, some companies some groups have made a tremendous job at, at trying to systematize you know make it understandable with KPIs clear indicators and everything but it's there's no common framework there's no shared framework so if we want to put a price on an externality that comes from these practices, we should certainly try to have a clear framework and clear, clear metrics. Thank you for that. Um, I do want to hear from Mike. I want to ask a question to Michael, but I think before I'm going to bring Peter in, maybe for your perspective on what we've just heard. We've spoken about farmers a lot in these last two interventions. Um, is your experience reflected here? What's your take on what we've just heard, especially about these, these indicators and, and this, um, yeah, the, the comments we just heard? Yes, thank you, uh, Natasha. Um, I think we, we can all agree on the fact that we should uh, try to change lenses from just yield to more, also more sustainable lenses. But the question is, like, there are a lot of lenses. You have uh, regenerative agriculture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, for the farmer, um, it's quite difficult to determine which lens to invest in and which lens, as a society, we're eventually going to conclude to reward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually the the, 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 the big question also for Rabobank. Um, I think you explained this very well. Uh, you want to invest in a safe, uh, uh, sustainable business model. Um, the problem is that we haven't defined that yet. And that's also uh, hampering the current transition we're in. So um, I think we also need a, a bit of help from um, maybe uh, some government agencies to uh, concur on a definition, which mm -hmm. allows us to also get some reimbursement from the market, some uh, de-risking, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, the numbers show its necessity. Young farmers are two to three times more likely to get their uh, loans of the bank um, applications rejected. Uh. Okay, well, let me come to you now, Michael. You've, you've had these different interventions, these, the, the issues that Peter just raised there. I mean, what do you see as the future pathways to action to unlock agricultural investment and to foster this public-private cooperation in this effort? And what do you make of this, um, the, you know, this need for the definition so that farmers know the direction they need to take? Yeah, thank you for, for this question. Uh, after having uh, listened to to my colleagues here on 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 on, on the panel, uh, my reply will be a little bit broader because uh, I think we, we we all know it's not only about investments. Huh? It's uh, very very uh, very strongly on practices. It's about uh, 
knowledge, etc. And uh, I think one, one thing we should also be aware, there is agriculture and there are tendencies in agriculture driven by market forces and then there's the CAP. And of course, certain ten tendencies in e economy happen. And we, of course, try with the CAP, for example, to foster public goods, for example, to foster the development of smaller farms, yeah? foster the viability of farms. But I think, of course, we have to, to, to see that with, with grants, uh, the public funding, uh, which is in, in the CAP, given the big challenges we are facing, climate change, uh, uh, the, the impact of uh, inflation, etc., etc., uh, to pay this with grants will not be, be, be enough. Yeah. And what I very much like here in this discussion, and I think this is also uh, important uh, for, for, for our topic, is we, we need a more integrated approach. Yeah? We, we, we need that different parties work together. Yeah? And uh, therefore, when, when it comes to, 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 uh, to farm uh, in, in investment, we need more cooperation between banks and agriculture to get a better understanding for, for, for the specificity of, of agriculture. Sometimes it's also a question of uh, perception of risks. Yeah? Well, I can imagine that maybe some other economic activities are much more riskier huh? <laughs> because many farmers still you have some assets behind, others not. Yeah, but, but I think so we need a better understanding for this, uh, for this specific uh, business. We have to develop with different parties uh, viable, sustainable business models. Yeah? So it's not only about cash flow. <laughs> it's, it's maybe also to come to invest in business which are yeah, resilient also in future, in, in, in 10, 20 years. There may be an investment where now in the next uh, 15 years you have good cash flow and it looks good, but then, yeah, because there are certain tendencies in, 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 in society, in, in diets, there are certain tendencies in, in climate change. So I think we have, maybe if the cash flow is not so dramatic uh, good now, but investing in a business which is adapted, prepared for the, uh, the climate change, and at the same time mitigates, may be a very good investment, maybe a better investment in some tra 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 traditional practices uh, which are not sustainable in, in, in the long run. So I think that's, so we, we have the sustainability uh, aspect, of course, in particular in our policy, where we, with grants, we finance in investments, we finance uh, the practices, for what you say. You say uh, practices which are not rewarded uh, uh, by the markets, for example, a farmer planting hedges, a farmer uh, no longer fertilizing, no longer, no, no tillage, uh, and this is not rewarded by the market. We finance this with our uh, agri-environmental program or our eco-schemes. Um, but we, but we, what we also do now is more and more to combine grants with, with, with credits, so that we maybe we have a, a project where there is one strictly non-profitable environmental component, but there's also some uh, business investment combined, and that we, with our instruments, with, with, with credit funding plus grants, get those very sustainable projects uh, on, on the road. And to, to finish, I think uh, the added value of our public fund uh, we, 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 we spent in, in, in financial instruments, so we have this 860 million by the end of 2022, which with the leverage makes 2.5 billion investments behind, which then also the money will come back, is first of all this leverage uh, uh, aspect, and that we with our public money, we take certain risks which were mentioned by my colleagues from, from, from the banking sector and also from the farmers, because we take the risk of missing collaterals in our financial instrument. We provide uh, the possibility uh, by our guarantees to come up with a longer maturity, longer loan, loan, loan time. And uh, we would like to see that this is more taken by member states in their programs. 
That's what we, why we work with the EIB to promote this idea. And we also have specific uh, loan programs by the EIB, in particular for agriculture, where also a part is dedicated to, to young farmers. We had a 1 billion euro loan program implemented, mm -hmm. just finished, uh, which was very successful. So we try with these different tools to really foster this transition. Okay, I'm aware of the clock ticking, but I'm going to try and squeeze one more question, maybe two, let's see how this goes, um, before we move to the Q&A. And I'll put the question to you, Nicolene. Um, I'm curious to hear about your thoughts about what you've heard so far, and maybe to, to, to finish on a... What do you see should change in the value chain to make finance more, more accessible, and, and, and what are your reflections on what we've heard so far? I think the willingness from uh, all the parties in the room here uh, and, the, and, and my fellow panelists uh, is, is, is there. Uh, it's a question of putting it together. So I feel like if, uh, you know, off takers and traders uh, can come up with a, a program to, uh, to incentivize and, and longer term off take contracts, that could help. Um, De-risking strategies from... Uh, uh, from the government who, who provide uh, partial guarantees uh, to, uh, to commercial banks, that could help. Um, I think some technical assistance funds that should be grants and donations, uh, that could help. Because I agree it's not about uh, CAPEX, it's often about OPEX. Uh, by OPEX I mean it's just about doing management practices and not necessarily buying big new machines as we would love to finance at Rabobank, of course, but it's not only about that. So uh, I think the willingness is there. It's a, it's a matter of becoming creative. Uh, stop discussing the frameworks and the definitions and start taking action. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, that's, it's the time now to do that. And uh, uh, banks could definitely play a role in uh, providing senior liquidity and also uh, rewards in, in a platform where all of this would come together. Okay, thank you very much for that. So we will now move to the Q&A session. Um, and I, uh, I think I saw the hand here. Yes. No, no luck with the microphone. Shame. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we can see. Thank you. Uh, Nigel Thorgrimson, representing Profile, the European Association of Fruit and Vegetable Processors. So um, maybe I can reflect on a point that uh, can maybe save us a couple of years here in the transition to regenerative agriculture. And that was, um, in fact, we heard that, that farmers in isolation are not able to develop the transition. And then we also heard uh, a statement that, that we need more cooperation. But I think we also need to precise that cooperation. So we had examples of McCain producing potatoes um, there is no such thing as a potato farmer because potatoes are growing on a rotation one year in five, one year in six, as indeed we heard the example of tomatoes from Unilever. Um, and again, there is no tomato farmer. They're growing in rotation. So unlike our, unlike our first panel, which was predominantly selling milk, these farmers have a supply chain, a downstream supply chain that's more complex. And if you are a fruit and vegetable grower, processor, requiring peas growing one year and six, or beans growing one year and six, you may want to invest and develop the sustainability, the regenerative agriculture platform, but how can you contribute when you only come back to that field every six years? We need something across the farm. So the point I was getting to was that it's not just about engaging downstream vertically, there was a need to horizontally look at the different players working together, maybe the, the vegetable processors working with the potato process, and so on. One final other observation is, um, and it's becoming painfully obvious, that um, as we talk about climate change mitigation and actions to avoid further greenhouse gas emissions and such like, at the same time we're talking about adaptation to climate change, to build resilience into our uh, farming systems, our food production systems, which was given actually at the introduction of, of the day's event on, on, on the handout. Um, what I'm seeing is that, particularly in indicators, 
and there was a, there was a meeting earlier this week um, from the European Commission on this, there's a merger. And yes, many of these indicators are good for both. They work for mitigation, avoiding greenhouse gas, and for uh, building resilience. But when they are merged together, you cannot coherently see the actions, certainly, I would say on the regenerative agriculture, the resilience of the farming systems, and it's not complete. For example, organic matter in its per se was not mentioned, and we heard today from, from Eric there, the, the importance of soil health um, was not mentioned as an indicator going forward. So I really suggest we actually separate the two things, and um, if we're talking about resilience and regenerative agriculture, let's focus on those and uh, have a separate for the mitigation. Thank you. Yeah, I th and I think that's the whole purpose of having uh, OP2B, for instance, as an initiative, is to gather basically this cooperation. I just want to take two examples, you know, that I think probably Guillaume also can, can elaborate, because you are perfectly right. When you talk agriculture, very often you talk rotation, and by the way, that's the best way to anticipate how the soil is, is going. So that requires coordination and cooperation, by the way. So, which means pre-competitive behavior as well in our industry. So... Uh, I know that uh, OP2B, for instance, is working on many initiatives like this. And, and for instance, I mean, as, as far as Unilever is concerned, unfortunately not in Europe, but we have a large-scale program where we're working with PepsiCo to alternate some of our cereal growing with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, PepsiCo in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the U.S. And, and that's been an intense coordination. So, yes, and I think there are also initiatives like this which I think for us as an organization is, is, a, is, is a, of course, a new way of working, fundamentally. Uh, you're right, and, and needs to be, uh, to be, uh, to be assessed. So, so we are going into that. I think there is a lot of learning also in, in this type, and it's not easy, and that requires very often the implication of local authority. I mean, in the U.S., it's clear that USDA is helping this, right, to be very specific. So I think... I think in Europe we need to have that, uh, that and I know that livelihood with, uh, with OP2B also is working on, on this type of initiative. So but definitely clear. And as far as soil health as an indicator, we had already the chance to exchange on that. But, but uh, yes, I think typically in, in our framework, this is the number one indicator, the, the carbon matter in the soil. And the more we can attach basically uh, the, car the new carbon uh, uh, legislation in Europe to I would say an indicator that monitor that, the, the, certainly the better as well. Okay. And Guillaume, you wanted to come in on this point? Yes, a quick comment, because Eric covered part of, um, of, of the topic uh, explained very, uh, very precisely. So, yeah, I just want to take an example. Exactly as you said, there's no such thing as a farm, uh, a potato farm. Uh, we... Uh, we we uh, we are working on that, and we have we have a few examples of a project. I have the example of a project for uh, where we have um, 100 farms, uh, each farm producing four to five different uh, materials, and we want to change the entire cycle. You don't just work on the potato cycle, of course, the potato rotation, the wheat rotation. You have to work on the entire farm. Then can the potato buyer pay everything, with or without grants? You need to find a wheat buyer, you need to find a um, corn buyer, you need to find enough buyers of the different rotations of that, uh, of, that, of that farm to make it work. And then you have to work with the several cooperatives working with the farmers. So you end up for this kind of project of 10,000 hectares and 100 farmers, roughly you end up with um, four of takers, FMCGs basically, three cooperatives, and the local authorities plus the EU at some somewhere in the map. That's a, that's a job in itself to convene these different animals and to make them work together. That's another layer. I'm not fond of complexifying things, but if we want to get there, we have to build this knowledge of convening and managing uh, coalitions around uh, around these topics. Thank you. I think Nicoline, did you want a quick word before we? Um, yeah, I thought one thing you said was very interesting is that uh, who is actually facing the farmer because he gets a lot of advice, or she, uh, they're getting a lot of advice from, from their bank, from their off-taker, from the feed company in case of, uh, or from the input company. And I think that that's, that could be a really interesting role for the government or, or Europe or local governments to play as well that uh, uh, the, the technical assistance and the agronomy is, is now, um, uh, it's not um, 
free of uh, subjectivity because the, the farmers' advisors, they all want something, right? So uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, some, some, some real objective advice is, uh, is also very important. Uh, I mean, in the bank, when we were discussing uh, the, the measures or the, the, the practices that, that would be more sustainable, at first, I have to admit, colleagues said, oh, but I only want to talk about CAPEX measures. So that's why I made the joke before. It's not objective. So uh, I think it could be very important to have objective uh, advice there uh, as well. OK, thank you very much. And McCain was mentioned a few times, and I've learned that there's, there's a representative in the room somewhere over here. Um, did you have something to add to that point? Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Yes. Yeah, so I'm Charles Aziter working for McCain uh, in the Regenerative Agriculture Program for CE. And one key success factor that we have seen in, in the program is for farmers, the confidence. They need to feel confident about the transition, which means that they need confidence from a technical standpoint, meaning that we need to provide training, because for some of them it's completely new, the new practices that are promoted in the regenerative agriculture. So this confidence is absolutely mandatory on a technical standpoint. They also need confidence in the off-takers, in the buyers, that they will still be there for them to purchase their raw material, because the transition is a long period of time and they should not uh, be left alone with their crops. So it's good to have multi-year commitments with the farmers. And I think they also need to be very confident on the fact that each of their off-takers will not ask for different things. So I have exactly the same language, exactly the same definition, and that is the philosophy of what we've done with Rabobank in the Netherlands, is that a farmer, we have compared our frameworks, Rabobank sustainability metrics, McCain regenerative agriculture framework, and we have designed correspondences. So what, what are the similarities? And we have made a decision to say, if a farmer is a master, master level of McCain, then automatically is an A-class farmer for Rabobank. But this is bilateral effort, so it's, uh, the, the scope is, is still limited. And what we really need from a policymaker point of view is this common definition. I think it has been mentioned by almost everyone that there is no such thing as a potato farmer. And we need one common definition, one common set of KPIs to define what is regenerative agriculture. And this is what will accelerate the adoption of regenerative practices uh, across the rotation of the farm. Okay. Ooh, lots of hands. <laughs> I just asked you to close. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just getting my microphone back. There's a lot of hands going up. I think I saw your hand first. Yes, would you like to take a question? And Yes, hello. So finally, I found a micro is working. Anna Hanshu on EcoBio, Food Fermentation Europe. Um, I just want to make a remark. Um, the, the title of um, our event today is about agriculture, and I think we miss out one important uh, field, and this is alternative protein. This is fermentation precision fermentation. So what I'm actually missing in this whole discussion is a, is a vision on a hybrid system. Because many of these problems we are now discussing, including sustainability, can be actually solved with the technology and solutions we have already, not saying that one will replace the other. So this is not a talk against farmers, but this is an, an invitation actually to open up a discussion and say, let's talk about an hybrid system, and especially when we talk about land use, biodiversity, we have these solutions. We can bring them to the table, but unfortunately, the current situation forces all these companies to go to the US. Um, I think, uh, Eric, did you want to come in on this yeah, point? Probably, Peter, we'll, we'll jump in. Thanks for bringing that. Yeah, innovation is key. And, and I think personally, I've, I've been, you know, uh, I'm involved in, in farming from family and or in my job. I, 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 I mean, Agriculture has always innovated. And, and I'm not sure if it's hybrid system, it's just maybe an evolution of the system, like farming has always evolved, right, also. I think it's very clear. So uh, just, to, just a couple of thoughts on that. I think uh, uh, there is, because we are in the financing of that, so you're right, this can be a tool, and this is a tool that needs to be financed, and financed to make sure that solution can be scaled. And I think there is another element, because we talked a lot of, of banks, about banks, Private equity can play a role here because that can be a way to bring long-term capital to scale solutions and make them accessible for a maximum number of people. 
And this, for instance, why with the Climate and Nature Fund at Unilever, we've decided to team up with AXA Climate for the risk part and with TKO Capital to create a dedicated private equity fund to invest into agriculture solution. And with that, we are trying to invest into areas like, for instance, biocontrol. We're trying to invest into areas like it's drip irrigation because we know drip irrigation works, but we know it's too expensive. So if you don't tr try to inject long-term capital to that, you cannot massify the solution. So, so that's, that's also a, another way. And I agree that we need to have this in some areas that are also sometimes a bit different depending on the value chain, some disruption, uh, either on the form of protein, as, as you said, or also on the practices on how you maximize basically and you adapt to the, to the climate change. So there are a, an incredible area here uh, that I think is, 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 is extremely exciting as well. You're right. So th thanks for mentioning that. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Peter? Peter? Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe to add on that, um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, or as you said, that you think it's a, mi a missing market in this uh, panel, um, I do think um, that hybrid way of uh, producing is facing similar problems in, in terms of investment, etc. And also, um, uh, more importantly, facing the same problem with the lack of uh, a, a good governmental structure around the definition of sustainability. So, um, in, in that sense, uh, um, I think we can be on the same page. Um, and I think we now moving forward to the question of the farmers in the corner. <laughs> yes, you've had your hand up for a while. Um, let, let me take your question over in the corner. Who that you'd like to put your question to? It's more about. Uh, have my, my view as a farmer, a future farmer, because uh, just the farm is just uh, 25 minutes uh, from here, so not far. My father started uh, conservation agriculture 30 years ago, so it uh, was not easy at the beginning, but I think that now we know to do it. We have a lot, uh, we share a lot with uh, farmers in France, uh, Great Britain, uh, Germany. Uh, it's I think that the knowledge now we have it. Uh, I think that the bank will be confident because when I see my banker, is not an issue and I have to have investment. I will say the biggest issue, I don't do enough hours with my tractors to buy a new wine. Uh, but it's something that we can mitigate a lot of issues like the climates. But I think the most issue that we have is the, uh, the rules with the, the cap because uh, like for the cover crops so in belgium we have to sow them before the 15th of september we have a late harvest and i know the the the, the importance of cover crops because when you do no till or that stuff it's the key of your system but for me we didn't have the time and the soil was not we have too much moisture it was not good to sow them before the 15, and you have a lot of farmers that to stay in the, uh, with the rules, they sow the cover crops, but they make damage to their soil just to respect the, the policy, you mm -hmm. know? And after you want that they understand, change practices, but you ask something that we will not do if it's a, uh, a crop for them. This spring was very wet. We have to wait to sow the sugar beets, early May, the potatoes to June, and we have to sow cover crops for the 15th of September, but it's not good. And I'm not finished yet. I will finish this weekend. I'm out low. But if you want to do things in a relative way, you have to do a lot of outlaw things because you work with nature, you work with soil, and you can cheat with that. And uh, something that we really need, it's more something more holistic, because we do holistic uh, agriculture. It's a system, and uh, really wait for that. And we still have no issue with, uh, with banks, but my brother is still waiting for these subsidies, for this first uh, installation from five years ago, and we are not able to do it because it's still not finished yet. And mm -hmm. my father can take his retirement too, you know. But I have no issue with the bank, no issue with the other thing. Okay. I have more issue with the policy. All right, well, and, let's uh, go to the policy makers then and see what, right. they make of, uh, <laughs> say what they make of your intervention. Michael, would you like to take this one? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, so thanks. And, and I think also the interventions from, from others I've heard, I think it, it shows that uh, yeah, agriculture is very diverse. Huh? So when we talk about... Uh, sustainability 
it's uh, we have different actors in 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 in, in agriculture. We also have different farmers, different size, different uh, natural conditions in, in in member states. So uh, it's quite difficult to come with a kind of clear cut EU concept. Yeah, but I think what what we already have now is, and that's what we apply for our. Uh, public support is very okay. There's a certain baseline, yeah, there's a certain normal standard, and we actively finance what goes beyond. And uh, there we are also, f uh, from the Commission, we are very, very open also to, to new ideas. And there was this uh, afternoon the mentioning of result based uh, schemes. We are very open to that. It's, it's difficult in, in the practice. We have some examples, for example, that farmers are paid if on, on their, on their uh, grassland they're, they're more, uh, there's more biodiversity, more endangered species. We welcome that and we also have that. Sometimes we have to uh, fiddle around with, 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 with legislation, but uh, it, it, it works and we have ex good examples uh, on, on that and we are open to that. Uh, it's not that we that we are not open to 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 adapt. The problem with this result-based approach is always how to quantify, who takes the risk when when there is no result. Yeah. And this brings me to to, to your uh, topic on on uh, uh, the uh, planting of, of of catch crops. I think with with the with with the, with, the, with the new reform with the new CAP. We really have reduced the rules on EU level drastically. So we have really said <clears throat> our maxim was to say, as the natural conditions, the situation of farming is so different in all the member states, it's more for the member state to think how, because we, we all believe in catch crops, the added value. But uh, you will not find any figure in the EU legislation when you have to plant your catch crops. Yeah? But on the other hand, uh, to make sense, at a certain moment you have to, to, to plant them, uh, that, they, that we get the environmental value. But then it's, that's, then it's to see with the member state, what is the inbuilt flexibility? Are there maybe certain uh, rules on, 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 on flexibility in, in, in built? And I think maybe we have to work more on that respect rather than asking uh, to define now again things on EU level. I'm very much open to the idea that we have flexible tools, the CAP mm -hmm. strategic plan is, is the idea, and that we use uh, the flexibility. Sorry for right. being longer. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, I would love to, discuss, to continue this discussion. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but as I said before, we do have the coffee break, so perhaps you could also speak in the coffee break um, a little bit about, about this point, and, and, and we can uh, talk further about that. But thank you very much to our panellists. I'm afraid I do have to bring this discussion to a close. Um, so if I can invite you all to take your seats, and I'd like to invite up um, our, the, the people that are going to do our closing remarks today. So thank you. And thank you very much. So for our closing remarks today, we have Marion Piquet, who is the Secretary General of SEJA. We also have Dirk Jacobs, who is the CEO of Food Drink Europe, and Stefania Avanzini, who's the Director of One Planet Business for Biodiversity. So welcome. All right, thank you. Marion, I will pass the floor to you first for your remarks. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Natasha, for the brilliant moderation, first of all, as usual. Um, we see lots of familiar faces in the room today. So first of all, uh, thank you to all participants for coming here. You have understood for those of you who know us in CIJA that dialogue is a very important feature of what we do. Here today is really a first step. Um, Having a dialogue is a path of learning, so there will be uh, future dialogues, there will be sometimes the necessity to have uncomfortable discussions, uh, this we will have in due time. Um, but I think what comes out of today is really that there is a very diverse agricultural sector. And what means diversity is that there's also many needs in terms of financing. So we've seen there's a very important investment gap in this sector, 
but you do have many vocations, many entrepreneurial choices that are made every day by young people who take willingly the decision to go into farming, to continue something that was existing in their family framework, or something that they decide to start from scratch. In both situations, the needs are clearly identified. We need to reduce the risk. We need to make sure that they have access to the capital, that they have enough collaterals. And beyond that, we need to train them, which CIJA is doing with a lot of passion, uh, to make sure that there are some instruments on the knowledge side, but also to make sure with all of you, uh, both public and private actors, that we actually have very strong advice, but also certainty. And I think certainty is both a public requirement with the regulations, but also a private one with the contracts yeah, that you decide to propose to farmers, with the practices that you are encouraging them to uptake. I think what we need to see is sometimes a bit more of bottom-up, a bit more of consultations of the farmers to understand what they're trying to do and to move on together with them. So I really count on, on this moment to, to create uh, an impulse in the dialogue that we have with the processing industry and with the rest of the value chain, I see a lot of upstream actors. Um, so I also want to really call on you to, to keep that dialogue alive. And we hope that next time we're able to bring uh, even more young farmers uh, to this discussion. And uh, that is the commitment that we are taking uh, to you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Dirk, let me turn to you now. You Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha, for excellent moderation. And a special shout out to the mother with the young baby. Congratulations. Uh, as a young father myself, my baby just turned eight months, so I can, only, I can totally relate. Um, also, thanks to uh, our co-organizers, OPTV, uh, Seja, uh, it, uh, it's, it's good to be here, be here. And I think what we've, what we've seen today is that food producers are indeed in the midst of the transition. Um, but at the moment, we're not reaping the full benefits of it. I think that has become clear uh, today. And um, if I take three sort of different themes within this discussion that we've had, I think it was first of all about de-risking. Um, de-risking in terms of decreasing the vulnerabilities that farmers face uh, that then trickle down in the rest of the, of the value chain is about de-risking in terms of investment, uh, but also in terms of regulation. And I think policymakers here in this house can also provide the stability and the clarity that, that companies, that farmers need in order to make their investment plans for the future. So de-risking uh, in, in many, many different senses. It's also about demystifying the second theme that I discovered today. It's about um, not having necessarily the access to knowledge. If many farmers do not know where to start. They need help to um, be convinced that there is a business model in regenerative or sustainable agriculture. So um, this, is, this is something that is very clear. And I think the, the, the trick that we sometimes, or the trap we fall into is that we are seeking for clarity at the same time. We are asking for definitions and stability and clarity and, and predictability, but also the there's a recognition that there's not a one-size-fits-all. So you need to have flexible, pragmatic approaches that allow the farmer to do what the farmer does best in, in, in managing the land, in being sort of the omni um, player uh, that has to take care not only of the income, but also of the biodiversity, of the climate, of so many different factors that are uh, taken into account. And then the third one is depolarization. Um, I think we need to change the narrative and see farmers and producers as part of the solution instead of uh, part of the problem. And I'm actually quite happy that uh, the Commission decided to engage in a strategic dialogue on the future of agriculture. Um, I think it would even be better if we would change that into a dialogue for the strategic future of agriculture. And I would add food as well to that. Um, I think food deserves a much higher place in the hierarchy in the EU and, and it should be seen as a political and strategic priority because we have the greatest food in Europe, uh, but we need to continue to be able to make that food in 10, 20, 30 years. 
uh, and we can only do that by investing now and, and not waiting uh, in, in a couple of years' time. So um, I would say that this is the start of the strategic dialogue uh, and hopefully with a lot of more discussions to follow within the chain, uh, but also with other actors that are a bit outside of the ecosystem. Um, I hope that we can continue that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, Stefania, for your closing remarks. Thank you very much. First of all, I echo to I really want to thank each and one of you who came here and also the, the youth and the younger generation that is here because we are actually investing in, in their future. So thank you for coming. And I, just a couple of things I heard today. I hope you walk out of this room today that you heard the sense of urgency as the current business as usual farming model is not working anymore. And you heard many different ways of new models that are working. So I, I think, I, I hope you walk out of this room with a sense of optimism and hope because you, you heard about solutions are working on the ground. The transition is happening. Farmers are at the heart and are driving this transition. I'm so happy to see so many young farmers that are doing it. And then we heard there is a need to scale up the transition. And here we had, and here we have, we have really talked about many topics one for sure being financing, and uh, the private sector alone cannot finance the transition. That is important. This is why they're calling for also public-private partnerships to accelerate and de-risk the transition. And I think the most important topic we caught all today is collaboration, the need for convergence. Uh, this is a little bit the, the reason why uh, One Planet Business for Biodiversity was created. And so I, I also walk out of this room with a little bit more homework to do because there is a need for convergence and collaboration, especially on what we want to measure at farm level, report and disclose on at corporate level, but most importantly, then reward farmers for. This is the alignment we need. There are many different ways uh, and, and farming uh, techniques, but the alignment we need is this one, because it's about, um, because ultimately it's about creating new, re new revenue models for farmers. And, uh, but last but not least, I want to echo the importance, this, the reason why we are hosting this event here today is that policymakers have a key role to play. We need a level playing field for, for, for enabling and accelerating this transition, and we need your support, support to scale it up. And I'm also very much looking forward to this future dialogue involving the whole value chain, because each actor of the value chain has a role to play, and I hope you understood it. There is a real everyone here in the room, from input providers to farmers to manufacturers to retailers, each one of us has a role to play to enable and accelerate the transition. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Excellent. Well, as, as Dirk said, as many of our panelists said, this is the start of the strategic dialogue, dialogue but definitely not the end, because we, def we now have a networking coffee. So if you'd like to continue the conversations or have any more questions, then now is your opportunity to do so. So enjoy your coffee. Enjoy your evening. Thank you very much for being such an excellent audience. And uh, I will see you soon. See you afterwards. Thank you very much.